Welcome to the Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. This is your most informative social political program you can find online. We bring you facts and updates on issues that matter to you. My name is Ismail Akwe, and in this edition, we are bringing you a mini series on religious tolerance in Ghana. And we're going to start with common misconceptions about religions in the country and we would focus on Islam. There are so many Muslims in Ghana and the recent census figures says Muslims are about 17% in the country, while Christians are about 71%. However, there's been some few issues of religious intolerance, but generally we classify this country as a very or highly religious tolerant nation. However, how do we think about ourselves? How do we relate to each other? What do people feel or know about other people of other religions? We're going to discuss this with a sheikh an Islamic scholar who is going to take us through some common misconceptions about Islam in Ghana. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back from the break. This is The Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. My name is Ismail Akwe and our guest is Sheikh Kishk Bashir Yandu, aka Ku Imam. He is also the founder of al Islam Center and an Imam. Welcome to the Lowdown. Thank you. How are you? I'm very fine. Good. Well, looking at you and also your status, everyone would agree that you are a through through Muslim and you've, you were born a Muslim. I, I must say that. However, people would ask, did you also go through the educational system in Ghana where students go to uh, worship on Wednesday and on Fridays you find Muslims in there singing? Did you really sing Christian songs? Did you pay money, I mean, the offer tree and all of that, do you do the same? Amazing grace, how sweet I know. In the youngsters, you remember back in the youngsters, uh, Wednesdays for, was for worship and Friday was for singing and we had singing notes. I think some few years ago, I saw my sing, old singing notes, mm. singing notebook. So, you know, gr growing up in such, you know, a dominant Christian, you know, society and you go to Christian schools, definitely, You'll go through all that. So there is no Muslim in this country who has gone to, you know, through the normal Ghanaian educational system and then he doesn't know worship, he doesn't know singing. Fast forward from the youngsters, primary GSS. I went to St. Augustine's College, mm -hmm. a Catholic school. And I can, I can, there's Angelus, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, blessed are you amongst women. So as a Muslim in this country, definitely we, you will know Christianity. It's, it's so profound that I believe Muslims know Christianity more than Christiani Christians know Islam in this country. Mm. Because we, we go to your schools and we sit with you and it's, it's quite difficult for you to find, you know, a Christian, you know, coming to the mosque and stuff like that. But because we've gone to school together and most of the schools are Christian schools, you find out that Muslims, you know, know Christianity a lot. But how was the feeling like? Because you already started preparing to be an Islamic scholar from early in your life, but you were going for the worship services, which are compulsory. And we went to St. Augustine's, we are going for uh, all the, um, I mean, the activities, the Catholic, is it Catholic? Yes. Catholic activities. What was the feeling like? Did you feel you didn't belong? Did you feel it was too much for you as a Muslim or you just accepted it? No, you see, in the youngsters, we're young, we're, we're young children, we're kids. So we're just following authority. You go, and even sometimes you find some of the Christian kids not even interested in worship, not even interested in singing, they complain. So if as a Muslim, you realize a Christian is complaining about Christian activities, you, you, you get some respite for thinking that you don't belong. But in actual sense, you don't belong there. That's a fact. But because it's school rules, you just follow it. For example, in, in St. Augustine's College, mass was compulsory. You have to go to mass, and then there was weekday mass where... I think my house, Glen House, you go to mass every Monday around 6 a.m. before you go to class. And I've never been to even one of them, even though, you know, roll calls will be made and then you receive, you know, some punishment, but we don't go. The issue is you are within that enclave and the enclave has rules and regulations. You just follow. And because most of the schools also know that we are Muslims, we are not pressured as much. But sometimes, too, you know, when there's a whole roll call in a school and then you're absent, you know what was going to face you. So we go to mass 
We sit, sometimes we sit at the back, sometimes we sit in the front. You sit wherever you want to sit to, we sit. But we don't join in the main religious activities. For me, I believe that uh, when someone is having their religious activities, you need to respect it. And uh, you don't believe in that. And you don't join them. You know, give them that respect. Give them that distance. Give them that reverence. Uh, respect what they are doing. So when I go to Mass back in St. Augustine's College, I don't join in a singing, I don't join in you taking communion. I've never done it before, but I go, I sit yeah. there and I listen to the sermon. I pick some lessons from there. Sometimes I disagree with some of the things and I even speak to the Father that, no, for us in our religion, is different. And the Father, I had a very good relationship with him that when he comes to teach us religious and moral education, I'm the one who makes the opening and closing prayer in Islam. Mm. So we, we have that, you know, cordial relationship and even back home, back at St. Augustine's College, the assistant headmaster was the patron of the Muslim Student Association of St. Augustine's College, Mr. I think Paul Asamoah. He was the assistant headmaster. Mm -hmm. And when we are going out to, you remember when we come to Agri Memorial, we came with the school bus. Mm -hmm. And the head, assistant headmaster comes with us. Every program. We even get exes to come home for Eid celebration. So they understood that there are Muslims there. But the school rules are such that you must go for mass. You must go for all this. When it's Angelus, you stand and then you say your Angelus. When it's time for dining hall, you go to the dining hall and then the dining hall prophet, you know, will say the Christian prayer. Me, I'm hungry. I don't care what prayer you're going, to, you're going to say. Just say your prayer. Let me eat my food. So, Sheikh, if you are asked, uh, what's the percentage of um, religious tolerance in the country? What will you, uh, I mean, assign no, it? We, we, we have a high rate of religious tolerance in Ghana. Um, there are one or two skirmishes there about. Sometimes you hear some pastors make some statements or you hear some imams make some statements. It's like that. It's normal that we will not agree 100%. We will not see eyeball to eyeball 100%. But Muslims and Christians in general, especially the masses, are okay. For example, when there's Eid, the Christian will want you to give you meat. You, he wants to come to your house. You know, you have that, you know, relationship. I quite remember when I was in St. Augustine's College, there's a room, a dorm mate. His name, his nickname is Memlo. When my mother visits and she brings two Ozafi, he tells Charlie, Charlie, we can no chop the two Ozafi, we pay home. You two, I don't want chop some. So we have that, you know, yeah. that good and cordial relationship. It's such that sometimes, you know, we have some, you know, hot-headed, you know, religious leaders who who make some, you know, some remarks that, you know, are not... Are not so which not percentage good. will you give? 90% or less? I've not, you know, really measured it, but it could be, it could be around that number, mm. not 90%. It could be. Okay. Could be. So could this be. show is just to look at some common misconceptions uh, about Islam, and we put together a number of them, thanks to the producer as well. Uh, let's start with the first one. Mm -hmm. Is Hausa the language of Muslims? Hausa is not the language of Muslims. Mm. Uh, the reason why people think Hausa is the language of Muslims is that Islam was spread across West Africa by the Hausa people. And they were merchants and then they were traders. So when they come and settle at a place, uh, definitely that's the language. So when the local people accepted Islam, these people are Hausa speaking people. And the people felt that since they are Muslims and Hausa is their language, then Hausa is the language of, of Islam. Not even the Arabic language is, uh, is that not even the Arabic language hmm. is language of Islam. Not even the Arabic. So language. Arabic is not the language of Islam. It's not the language of Islam. The reason why I'm saying this is a lot of people who disagree with me on this. You don't need to understand the Arabic language before you become a Muslim. But the Arabic language is the language with which the is Islam has been revealed. So you, if you want to be a Muslim scholar, you must understand the Arabic language. But you don't necessarily have to understand the Arabic language for you to be a Muslim. Mm. I hope you, you get the distinction. Because when my people hear me say Arabic language is not the language of Islam, I'll be bashed. And I know that. But so you I have to, to make learn that Arabic to be able to, to read the Quran to yes, pray. Yes, yes. But you don't, you don't necessarily have to understand, understand. the language mm. to be a Muslim. Otherwise, 90% of Muslims on the surface of the earth are not Arabs. They don't speak Arabic. So does that disqualify them as Muslims? That is why I explained what I mean by Arabic language is not the language. Let me even, let me even qualify it more. The Arabic language is not the language of the Muslim, but the Arabic language is the language of Islam. Okay. Because the difference between Islam 
and then the Muslim. The Muslim is the one who's supposed to follow these rules of Islam. And the Muslim might fall short. So Arabic language is not his language because you find a Chinese Muslim, you find a Hausa Muslim, you find a Ga Muslim, you find you know, an Arab Muslim, you find a Frafa Muslim. And they might not necessarily even understand anything in the Arabic language. Well, let me bring another perception. It's said that any northerner who is seen, they say he's a Muslim. Then a northerner, like even John, former President John Mahama, he's been called a Muslim or tagged a Muslim so many times, even though he doesn't respond to it. But he's a Christian, he was born a Catholic. Is that also a misconception? It's also a misconception. The Speaker of Parliament is a northerner, but he's not a Muslim. Mm. We have all that. Uh, some time ago, I think, the chairman of the new Patriarchy Party, uh, Paul Afoku, he's a northerner, but he's not a Muslim. So mm. you have that it's the being a nonna in ghana doesn't necessarily mean that you're a muslim even though the north is predominantly muslim the same way as being a southerner doesn't necessarily mean you're a christian but the south is predominantly christian so can someone be born a muslim or the person has to um, i mean ascribe to the islamic religion before they become a muslim no in islam we have a belief that every person born is born a muslim Every person born is born a Muslim. And you see, the idea is that when people don't understand what, when we say Islam, what is Islam? Islam is a set of rules and regulations between you and the creator, between you and yourself, and between you and your fellow human being. And Islam is a lifelong religion from Adam to Muhammad. Muhammad is just the seal of the prophethood. So in Islam, you find as we have Abraham, we have Moses, we have Noah, we have Joseph, we have Benjamin, we have all those prophets that are found in the Bible. And Islam is just a final continuation of all these other prophets' message. So for, for us Muslims, the idea is that everybody is born a Muslim. And a Muslim is someone who submits his will, his desires to what the Almighty wants. So basically, everybody is born a Muslim. But then the environment and then the society that one might be born in might influence that. Mm. So if someone is born in a in, in a Buddhist home, definitely he's going to pick that. If someone is born in a Taoist home, in a Confucian, he's going, to, he's going to build that. So if someone is born in a Judaism home, definitely he's going to pick that. If someone is born in a Christian home, he's going to pick that. Will a non-Muslim die if they touch the Quran or the Buddha? <laughs> if I have the Quran and I'll have, have you, you know, when you touch the Quran. You know, uh, the Quran is not, you know, some magical book or you know some you know some some strange book that if you touch i think apart from the bible the quran is the most published book in the world and that's been translated into many languages but the quran itself in the arabic language is there we have arab christians mm -hmm. they pick there is one arab christian who is a debater he's called anis shorosh if he comes to debate muslims he's a christian if he comes to be debate muslims he brings the Arabic Quran and then he reads it in the Arabic language. So there's nothing wrong with, you know, a non-Muslim touching the Quran. You won't vanish. You won't die. You won't be struck down by anything. Uh, you won't get lost. You won't fall sick. There's nothing like that. And the Buddha. Yes. I uh, hear so, if you touch the Buddha, uh, nothing something is, might happen to you. Nothing is, not, nothing is going to happen to you. I have a lot of Christian friends who have Buddha in their homes because if they go to the toilet they use it to wash themselves so there's nothing the buddha doesn't have any religious significance you can just get a tin for you to perform your ablution with if you have a tap you just open the tap and perform your ablution but the buddha doesn't have any religious significance and what about the counters i don't know whether to call it rosary but the christians have one the yes. catholics they call yes. it rosary yes. and then muslims also hold yes. some we see others having it around their necks is that a, a religious symbol the rosary is not a religious symbol it's just a counter that helps you to count when you are saying your incantations or you are saying your prayers. But it in itself, it's not a religious symbol. Mm -hmm. I don't use it. And there are a lot of Muslims who do not use it. But the ones who use it, they use it. But then it is not considered as a religious symbol. It's not considered as a sign of piety that if you hold it, you are more pious than someone who doesn't hold it. It's not a religious symbol. Okay. There's one other popular one I had. Uh, I'm told that when Muslim children are born, and a ram is slaughtered, mm. uh, the blood is used for a ritual to protect the children from evil. Blood in itself in Islam, animal blood in Islam is prohibited. Prohibited? Yes. 
The Almighty Allah says in the Quran, "Qul lan yanala Allah luhumha wa la dimaha, walakin yanaluhu taqwa minkum." When you slaughter those rams, the Almighty doesn't need the blood nor the meat. He also he is only looking for your God consciousness. So we slaughter the rams in open space. We don't hide in the kitchen to slaughter the rams for us to collect the blood. We dig pits and then we bring the animals by the mouth of the pit and then we slaughter them and then the blood flows into the pits. We don't collect any blood. And in protection of kids, we in Islam we believe in the recitation of incantations to protect the kids. That's what we do. We recite verses from the Quran. We recite prayers. Same way as every other religion believe that I'm praying to protect myself. I'm praying to protect my kids. That's what we do. But, you know, some rituals. Muslims, we have our rituals. But then, rituals in the term, rituals that people think that uh, we let people vanish. And then we'll give people money. And then we'll give people success. We don't believe that. Muslims do not do that. Those people you call malams who do that. Malam is an adulterated form of the word muallim in Arabic language, which means teacher. So malam by default is someone who teaches. But those people who have signboards, who send you messages, mm -hmm. they are charlatans, they are thieves. They are not Muslims. In Islam, if we're practicing Islamic law, Islam says those people should be killed. For they are spreading you know, confusion on the surface of the earth. Some few months ago, you remember some kids killed a boy in Kaswa yes. because they were told by one malam to bring the head of a human being so that they would get money. You see, these kind of people, they must be killed because they are spreading what confusion on the surface of the earth. We'll talk more about the malams and mm. also being dealt with by the law. Mm. This is the lowdown on Ghana Web TV. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. My name is Ismail Akwe. We are discussing common misconceptions about Islam. And our guest is Sheikh Bashir Kishk Yandu. And he is the founder of the al Islam Center. He is taking us through a lot of important uh, issues and discussions. You, we just spoke about Malams. You are saying they are not Muslims. The Malams with the signboards saying, come and then they will double your money for you, they will make you rich, they will heal you and all these things. How are they not Muslims? Because we see them sometimes using the Quran, holding, uh, I mean, the counting, uh, um, I mean, device and doing all of all sort of things. Some of them speaking Hausa and re reading Arabic. How are they not Muslims? You see, in Islam, nobody has the power and the mind to avert danger or to give you anything except the Almighty Allah. So if any human being says, come, I'll give you money. Come, I'll give you success. That person is challenging the authority of the Almighty. That is one. Number two, they are going to be dealing with evil spirits. In Islam, we have the jinns too. These, within the jinns, there are good ones and then there are evil ones. Normally, they use the evil ones to perpetrate all these you know, evil things that they do. And at the end of the day, anybody who goes to them... Is told either bring the head of someone or bring someone's leg or bring a baby. All these things are evil and Islam doesn't promote that. And this is what those people do. So in Islam, those people are not Muslims at all. And for the fact that they put on a cap and hold the rosary and hold the Bible or hold the Quran, sorry, they are not Muslims. Holding the Quran doesn't make you a Muslim. Same way as holding the Bible doesn't make you a Christian. So in Islam, those people must be dealt with within the Islamic law. And I call upon the national security or so over to deal with those people mm -hmm. because the rate at which people are getting lost, the rate at which, you know, crime is going high, the rate at which, you know, babies are getting missing from our hospitals is alarming. And I can say, I can put my head on a guillotine that it's those people. They are the ones who are pushing all those people to go into those activities. And if we don't, you know, stem the tide, Seriously, it will not be safe in our country because if someone is being told that if I bring Ismail's head, I'll get $10 million, will you be safe? Mm. You wouldn't be safe. Now, what about those who patronize them? No, you see, we have gullible people, definitely. And people are desperate. Uh, you know, 
I've seen someone ride, you know, a Range Rover Evoque and also want to ride it and I don't know what businesses the person has done, how, you know, the person has toiled to get that money to buy that Range Rover and I also want to get that Range Rover. I also want to go into money rituals and th those boys we made mention of earlier on in Kasua, 16 year old boy, you want to use Range Rover for what? Mm. So he'll be pushed to, to go and kill his fellow brother to take the head to get those money. So those people, they are not Muslims. But are Muslims uh, ascribed or do they pick leaders or sheikhs like yourself? Maybe you have people following you and you tell them to do what to do. Is that something that Muslims are supposed to do from birth? Yeah, you have yes, people they yes, follow. Yes, Muslim, a Muslim should always ask the learned person. You see, Islamic religion is a religion of knowledge. Everything that we do is documented. We don't get to get up and then think and say we are thinking in Islam within the Islamic rituals and forms of worship you don't think outside the box you think inside the box which is Islamic you know uh, forms of worship do not accept innovations whatever you're going to innovate should be in, in, in terms of worldly affairs you know you know electricity stuff like that but then the forms of worship you don't innovate everything is documented so as a Muslim you ask the big men the sheikhs who have studied who have read who know the religion okay what's the ruling on this what's the ruling on this how am I supposed to do this how am I supposed to do that that is allowed that is allowed for a Muslim but how does one become a sheikh because we have these people you call charlatans mm -hmm. the malams on the roadside mm -hmm. uh, I mean, portraying themselves as sheikhs. No. Some use the, even the, the title sheikh. No. How does one become a sheikh? And how it, do you know which sheikh is right? The sheikh is the Arabic language, is the Arabic word for old man. Mm. Old man. Sheikh, yes. Okay. Arabic name, language for old man. But then, it has been used metaphorically for someone who has studied. Mm. So, for example, you go through a schooling system. The makaranta that people hear of Saturday and Sunday makaranta, previously, before Muslims started, started joining secular schools, we attend the Makaran test from Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. We only break on Thursdays and Fridays. But then because we wanted our kids to also join, you know, the Western education system, we had to cut off three days out of it. And then the kids go to school Monday to Friday and Saturday and Sunday they go to Makaranta. In advanced Muslim countries, it's not like that. They go through it, the education. So for example, you go through Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. After going through that, after completing St. Augustine's College, there's an institute in Nima, uh, Islamic Research Institute, Institute for Islamic Studies. I went there, I spent five years. Five years? Yes. After St. Augustine's after College? After St. Augustine's College, okay. I spent five years. And I went through JHS there and SS. We have that. That's Arabic JHS Arabic and Arabic JHS and SHS. We have them. They are split across the country. And they don't teach English. It's Arabic language that they teach. We have them in Kumasi. We have them in Accra. We have them in Kaswa. We have them in Tamale. They are there. From there, you go to university. But unfortunately, we don't have an Islamic university in Ghana. Okay. We have Islamic University College. But then, it is not in the mold of the Islamic universities you have in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, you know, and, and Egypt and mm. stuff like that. So I had to go to Niger, Niger here, Islamic University to study. Did my first degree, did my second degree, and as we speak now, I'm doing my PhD in Islamic law. And it's all in Arabic? It's all in Arabic. <clears throat> you have to go through that. So when you go through that, you now become a scholar in the Islamic, what, in the Islamic field. Same way someone goes through medical school, same way someone goes to, you know, you know university and then undergrad, postgrad, and then doctora, you call him doctor, so, so, and so, doctor, so, and so. We have a plethora of them. DDs in Islamic studies in Ghana, we have them. So those are the sheikhs, those who have gone to study. It's more than 20 years of education. Yes, yes, people go and study. So someone cannot sit in some corner and then, you know, do some charms and then he calls himself sheikh when other people have gone to study the rudiments of the religion, to study what the religion says, and they come and teach. I bet we should start demanding for certificates. At Definitely. least they could paste certificates in their offices and then we'll say, okay, yes, you are really yeah, learned. Even those person. people who are learned do not, you know, do those, those, mm. those, you know, those, 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 what do you call them? Those charms and stuff. Those who are learning don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. They have time to teach people what the religion is. And you find some of them at the religions department in Lagos teaching. Some at UCC, some at KNUST. They teach. They teach Arabic language and Islamic studies. Mm -hmm. Those people on the streets put them in Lagos and tell them to teach to teach people Islam and see what is going to happen. 
That's yeah. where we see they are not qualified to even be called even Malams. Yeah. Actually, they aren't even Muslims. Now, let's talk about Makaranta. You brought yeah. it up. So, yeah. Makaranta is a madrasa, the yeah. school yeah. where um, I think Islamic religion is taught yeah. and also Arabic. Yeah. People have the misconception that at Makaranta it's, it's, it's just noise because mm -hmm. you hear a lot of children screaming and neighbors are complaining and all of that. Is it just noise or what really happens in there? You know, when you don't understand what someone is doing or saying, you think the person is making noise. Mm. It's like that. So because people don't understand the language that is being used there in the, in the Makaranta, people think that these guys are making noise. But if you really understood what they are saying over there, you wouldn't think they are making noise. It's not noise making. For example, you go to schools and then they are day nursery. A, B, C, D, twinkle, twinkle, little stars. Do we say they are making noise? No, because we understand what they are saying. But because we don't understand what the boys are reading or the children are reading in the Makaranta, oh, these people are making noise, they are disturbing my ears. But if we understood what they say, we wouldn't say they are making noise. So it's not a noise making place. Okay. It's an educational center. Mm -hmm. And the voices that are being raised, you know, educationists will tell us that when someone, you know, reads something aloud continuously, it sticks better than saying it silently. So rote memory and memorization is like that. And that's what was used, you know, for, you know, in the nursery where they are made to mention it out loud to, for, for memory. So you find out Muslims have one of the sharpest memories in the world. The Quran is 6,666 verses. And you have more than 1 million Muslims in the world who have memorized this book, 600-page documents from page to page. With all due respect to our Christian communities, how many Christians do you know who have memorized the Bible? Mm. Page to page. No, you don't have it. But Muslims, you go to Nima, you find a 10-year-old boy that he's memorized the Quran. And we have Quranic competitions, memorization competitions across the world. Just recently, there is one, you know, sister media house that organized a Quranic memorization competition. And the first person was given $5,000 for memorizing the Quran. So that root memory and that voice raising, it's not noise making. It's a system of education that even, you know, scientists now have proven that is very, very effective in memory. And... Islam is a religion of knowledge, so you need to know everything that the religion comes with. So you need to memorize a lot of things for you to stay, you know, afloat. So that's what happens in... So the reading Makaranta. out loud helps with memorization. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now the other question, uh, do Muslims pray through the Prophet Muhammad? We don't pray through anybody. In Islam, we don't, the Almighty Allah doesn't have any protocol. He doesn't have any secretary. He doesn't have anybody who, you know, packs his files and sends him to him. No. Muslims go directly to the Almighty Allah. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is just a messenger who was sent with a message. We don't worship him. We don't worship through him. We revere him. We admire him. But then he's a servant of God. Okay. And is the Prophet um, the personal savior and lord of Muslims? No. In Islam, we don't have a personal savior. We don't have a lord. The Lord is the Almighty. He's the only savior. Mm -hmm. The Prophet... Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we said earlier on, is this the final messenger that the Almighty sends to mankind? We believe that throughout the ages, when there's an issue, the Almighty Allah sends someone to rectify the affairs of the people. So He sent Noah to rectify an affair. He sent Abraham to rectify an affair. He sent Moses to rectify an affair. He sent Jesus to rectify an affair, and then He sent Muhammad to rectify an affair. So all these prophets brought the same message, but then their rulings might differ. Mm. So Muhammad is just a final, you know, piece of the jigsaw of the messengers that the Almighty Allah sent. So he's just a messenger. He brought a message, and that's his job. We don't worship him. We don't pray through him. He's not our savior. We don't have to do anything to him. What we even do is we even send prayers upon him. We send blessings upon him. We, we revere him. We, we admire him. But we don't worship him in the sense you know, of the word worship. We rather celebrate him, rather admire him. So in talking about the prophets and also the men of God, do Muslims believe in Jesus Christ and the Bible? Islam is the only non-Christian faith that makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ. The difference between the Muslim and the Christian is that the Christian has taken Jesus to be a divine being. But for us Muslims, he's not a divine being. He had an immaculate birth. 
we Muslims believe that Jesus Christ's birth was a miracle. A lot of modern day Christians do not believe that. Go to America. A lot of modern day Christians do not believe Jesus Christ was born of a virgin birth. But we Muslims believe. There's a whole chapter in the Quran. Quran chapter 19 is named after the mother of Jesus, Mary. Muhammad doesn't have his mother's name in the Quran. He doesn't have his wife's name in the Quran. He doesn't have his daughter's name in the Quran. But the mother of Jesus' name is mentioned in the Quran. And she's the only female mentioned by name in the Quran. The third chapter of the Quran is called Surah to Al Imran, the chapter of the family of Imran. And Imran, according to Muslim literature, is the father of Mary. So Muslims believe in Jesus Christ, but then we don't believe in his divinity. We don't believe that he died on the cross. We don't believe in the resurrection. We believe that at that time, anyway, we are in the Easter period. At that time, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed that, Oh Lord, it is through your will, not my will. If it is possible, take this cup away from me. We Muslims believe that the Almighty Allah answered that prayer and that cup was taken away from him. That is, he was saved. It was rather Judas Iscariot who was hung on the cross according to Islamic literature. So Jesus was saved right there in the garden. In the garden. When the Romans came when in. When the Romans came him. in. Because Judas Iscariot came to point who was, who, even in the Bible, they said he came to kiss him. And kissing him is that he is Christ. So take him away. We Muslims believe that when he came in, an angel stood between him and Jesus. And he didn't see Jesus. So the angel just, you know, touched his face and then he gave him the likeness of Jesus. So when he went to tell the Romans that, no, Jesus is not in there, some of the Roman guards who knew him said, shut up, you are Jesus. You are telling us Jesus is not in there. So they took him away and then they crucified him. And Jesus was lifted up into the heavens. So we Muslims believe he's still alive. He's in heaven. At the end of time, he will come back. And then he will come at a time whereby there is chaos and destruction and disaster on the surface of the earth. And then he will come with mercy and justice. And then he will reign as a king on the surface of the earth. So we believe, believe in the second coming We believe in the second coming of Christ mm. in Islam. We believe in that. Okay. We believe he's the Messiah. We believe he's, he's, he's the Christ. We believe he's the man of God who did miracles in when he came. In the Bible, the first miracle that Jesus Christ did was he turned water to wine. For us Muslims, the first miracle he did was that he spoke as a baby. The very first day he was born. His mother, she was a pious woman. They knew her. And then they just saw her with a fresh baby. And it's like, ah, but you, hey, Mary, I will call, sorry. And you're going to get pregnant. And the baby just spoke. No, 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 no. My mother didn't fornicate to give birth to me. I am a very different child. I was sent by God. I'm here to do this. I'm here to do this. I'm here to do this. So in the Quran, his first miracle was that he spoke as a baby. How so can, believe, where, where can we find that part? In it's the in the chapter, chapter 19 of the Quran, mm. the chapter of Mary. Okay. The chapter begins speaking about Zachariah. Mm. Zachariah we have in the Bible. Yes, the chapter begins about speaking, speaking about him and speaking about the birth of John the Baptist. We have it in the Quran. And then he comes to speak about the birth of Jesus Christ too in the Quran. So do Muslims believe in the Bible? We believe in the Bible. We believe in the Bible. But the problem is that this Bible that we have, with all due, due respect to Christians, there are a lot of things in there that originally God didn't put in there. For example, the Catholics have a Douay Bible, which is about 79 chapters. The Protestants have 66. So who sat down and then took out seven books out of the Bible or took out those books and said, those books are apocrypha. They are not supposed to be in there. Who did that? Why will God reveal something and someone who said somewhere and said, oh, these books do not qualify to be? So that's where we have it. But we believe that God revealed a book to Jesus, which is called the Gospel, Injil. That's what we, we mentioned. We never call it Injil. Yes, God revealed a book called Torah to Moses, which is called Pentateuch, the first five you know, chapters of the Old Testament. We believe God revealed Zabur, the Psalms, to uh, David. We believe that even Abraham had a book that is called Soul of Ibrahim, you know, mm -hmm. the papers of Ibrahim. So we believe in all these things. This is quite interesting. And before <laughs> we go on this break, let me ask this last question. Mm -hmm. I heard this uh, at um, a station, a, 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 a lorry station. Someone was preaching and a person said, well, Muslims don't eat pork because when the prophet Muhammad died, pork ate his body. <laughs> How true is that? Why don't Muslims eat pork? We don't eat pork the same way as 
The Bible says in Exodus and Leviticus that don't eat pork. Don't eat that animal. Don't eat the swine. It's a filthy animal. That's why we eat it. We don't eat it. It's the same way. So I find it quite astonishing that Christians eat pork. I have a lot of Christian friends who they say it's very, very nice. You people are missing something. I said, but it's there in Leviticus. It's there in Exodus that don't eat pork. What are you doing? They tell me, oh, that is the Old Testament. Okay. Jesus Christ claimed New Testament to change everything. And I tell him, no. Jesus Christ said, don't think I have come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill the law. He didn't come and change anything. He just came to fulfill the law. So we Muslims, we don't eat pork because it's stated in the Quran that don't eat that animal. As, we say, as I said earlier on, you see all these prophets, they came with the same message. So same way that the Almighty Allah told the children of Israel through Moses in Exodus or even in Leviticus that don't eat pork is the same way in the Quran that the Almighty Allah is also repeating the same message maybe 4,000 years later after Moses or 3,000 years later after Moses that Muhammad, tell your people same way I told Moses and his people, don't eat pork. So the swine has no business around the body of Prophet Muhammad? At all. Is the body still uh, there? Yes, the body is still there. Mm. It's buried uh, in Medina. The, but the which Medina? Is it the one after <laughs> Legon? Or no, which not the Medina? one after Legon. There's a Medina in mm. Saudi Arabia. Okay. And that is where he lived, and that is where he died, and that is where he was buried. And you know, Medina in the early stages used to be a predominantly Muslim community. Okay. So when they moved them there... Which Medina are you talking about The now? Medina in Legon. After Legon. Okay. The, one, the one in Legon. Yes. When they moved them there... I don't, I don't remember during which, you know, government period at all. They moved them there. That's when they named the place Medina because they were Muslims. They loved the Medina of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's quite interesting. This is the lowdown on Ghana Web TV. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back from the break. This is the Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. My name is Ismail Akwe. We are discussing common misconceptions about Islam. Our guest is Sheikh Kish Bashir Yandu. He is the founder of Al Islam Center. So we're talking about the prophets and we talked about pork. Now let's just talk about Hajj, mm -hmm. Mecca. Many, many Muslims, millions mm -hmm. of Muslims mm -hmm. go to Mecca every year. Mm -hmm. And there's this perception that those who go to Mecca and return, they become rich, they become millionaires. <laughs> I, I, you've been to Hajj before? No. I get, you've not? Okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you know someone who has gone to Hajj, but are they millionaires when they return? The criteria for going to Hajj is that you must be a millionaire before you go. Millionaire? In Ghana's terms or yes. in dollar terms? In Ghana's terms. Okay. You see, Islam, the five pillars of Islam, the first one is professing the statement that there's no God worthy of worship except the Almighty God. Mm. That one, you do it in public, everybody sees you. The second one is the five daily prayers. That one is composite, everybody will do it. <clears throat> but the third one is giving of zakat, giving of alms. Mm. And now, within, it, it must, your net worth in a year must be equivalent to or more than 85 grams of gold. And 85 grams of gold now is about 35,000 Ghana seed. So after the fiscal year, your business fiscal year, you take out whatever, you know, loans that you've taken. The profit that is left, if it is 35,000 Ghana CD or more, you're supposed to give out 2.5% of it once a year. 2.5% of it. The Christians have tightened that is 10% every month. Mm -hmm. But ours is 2.5% a year. And even that 2.5% is not for everybody. It's not compulsory for everybody. If your net income is 35,000 Ghana CD and above, it becomes compulsory upon in you. In totality in a year? In totality in a year. Okay. The next one is the fasting. The fasting is the month that we are in now. It is compulsory for everybody, but there are exceptions to the rule. Kids who have not reached the age of puberty are not supposed to fast. Pregnant women are not supposed to fast. Lactating women are not supposed to fast. Old people are not supposed to fast, and then people with chronic illnesses are not supposed to fast. So you see there's an exemption to the rule. And then finally comes the Hajj. It's the last one. 
It's supposed to be done once in your lifetime. And then the Quran is very, very emphatic and categorical about it. Liman is ilayhi sabila. For the person who can afford. So by default, you must afford before you go. But what if you cannot afford, but then you have a rich family member who decides, you know, to get the visa for you, to get the plane ticket for you, to get the hotel reservation for you, to even give you pocket money. No problem, you can go. For now, I think a year or two ago, it was about $3,500. Dollars? Yes, mm. to go. Within this system, $3,500. It's not easy money. And then you go to, you eat, because at least the rituals themselves, the rituals take about five days mm. to perform. But people might spend a month in there, you know, feeding yourself and stuff like that. But then the perception that when you go, you come back, you become rich is that when we go there, we pray earnestly. We seek for something from the Almighty because we believe that that is the holiest shrine in, the history, in, in, in Islam. So when you go there, whatever you pray, prayer you say is answered. So when you come back, people see, you know, the, 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 the glow. The glow. <laughs> and they think that you have money. After some few day, few months or years, everything is finished and then you go back. To, we know a lot of people, excuse me to say, who have gone to Mecca and then they come back and then they still go to public toilet. It has not changed anything. And those who are being financed by politicians. You know, for me, mm. for me, I don't believe that the politicians must finance anybody to go to Mecca, especially for us Muslims. The reason why I'm saying this is that not that if the person goes to Mecca, his, uh, his Hajj is not accepted. No. I believe that Muslims in Ghana have a lot of pertinent issues that must be solved. For example, if the politicians are sending 500 people to Mecca and each person you are spending about $3,000 on them, $3,000 times five is about $15 million. With that $15 million, can't we build a senior high school in Nima for the Nima kids to go to school? That $15 million, can't we build a factory in Abu Abu Kumasi for the young Muslims to go? At the end of the day, we are serving just 500 people with some huge amount of money. They go and then they come back and they are still wallowing in poverty. And they are still running around the politicians for the freebies. But if the politician is smart enough and then really puts the community at heart, okay, I'm not sending 500 people to Mecca. The government says, I'm not sending anybody to Mecca. That amount of money, 50 million cities. That's $150,000. $150,000, even $150,000. Mm. We can have serious projects with it. But then, because the politician wants to be just be popular, and then I've sent people to Mecca, they go and come back, and they still wallow in poverty. So the idea is you must be, you know, prepared financially before you go there. Mm -hmm. But then when we go there, we pray, and then when we come back, yes, we see the effect. But then the problem is if you go and then you pray, and Almighty gives you enough money, and then you don't have the technical know-how on how to invest that money, within a year or two, you return back to your bankruptcy. So it means you need to have money before you can go. Definitely. And not necessarily you going and when you return, you become rich. No, 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 no. That's not the idea. That's, that's quite interesting. That's not the idea. Mm. That's not the idea. Let's come to Ramadan. I hear a lot of people saying, well, Muslims fast from 6 to 6. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? It, the idea is not 6 to 6. It's dawn to dusk. Mm. So it's from sunrise to sunset. And depending on the geographical area you're in, <laughs> dawn to sunset is, is different. For example, if it's in winter, uh, I was in the U.S. in winter, and then uh, sunset was 4.30. 4.30? Yes. P.M.? P.M., 4.30. And before that, in the summer, it was 9 p.m. Mm. So it's dawn to dusk. That's the idea. You eat at dawn, and then when the moment we say that dawn prayer, you and food and water and sexual intimacy with your wife or your husband, let me be very clear here, with your wife or your husband. Islam doesn't recognize sexual intimacy between couples who are not married. We call them partners. When you say couples in Islam, it means people who are married. And then it's also between a male and a female. So that's what Islam says. So no eating, no drinking, no sexual intimacy with your spouse. And then there's also some other things, you know, be careful about what you say mm. to people. You know, this tongue is very, very soft, but then it's a very, very sharp knife. It can cut. So you be very careful about that. From dawn to dusk. 
So the moment it is that, you know, evening prayer, the one you see that the moment darkness starts setting in, you hear us cry, Allah Akbar. So that's the time for you to break your, your fast. The moment you break your fast, all those prohibitions are turned back. Mm. You can eat now, drink now, have sexual intimacy with your spouse, till dawn again for a period of 30 days. No water, however, during no, the fast. No water. Because a lot of people say, oh, Muslims are fasting, I'm going to fast with them. And these people may be Christians of other faith, and then they say they want to fast with them. Then they start at 6, mm -hmm. end at 6, but drink water in between. So it means if you really want to do it like the Muslims are doing it, you don't have to drink water. Ours is dry. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. It's dry. It's but you have dry. to eat before you start the fast. Yes, you have to eat. Is it compulsory? Time. And isn't it's that... It's not compulsory. That, okay, it's not. It's not compulsory. Mm. It's not compulsory. But then there's a lot of, you know, health benefit in the eating before. And there's also a lot of spiritual benefit in the okay. eating before, you know. We call it the pre-dawn pre -dawn meal, as sahur that's what it's called in Arabic. Trying to make it easier to fast within the day. Yes, because the idea of fasting is that the Almighty doesn't want us to suffer. That's not the idea. That when the Muslims are fasting, it's just a self-inflicted, you know, you know, hardship. No. You read Allah The Almighty Allah wants easiness for you. Wala you read He doesn't want you to be in perpetual, you know, you know, adversity. He doesn't want that. So you take the freedom meal. Eat as much as you can. No problem. But then the moment the dawn prayer sends in, that's it. You don't eat. So, and you can't remember as young as seven, we were fasting throughout. And there's nothing, nothing has happened to us. And Muslims are allowed to work during yes. their fast? Yes, you're allowed to You work. can't take a break off? Maybe if you're your own boss, you take a break <laughs> off. But <laughs> if you're working for someone, you see, that's, that's, that's where the importance of, you know, God consciousness comes in. That you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and then you give to God what belongs to God within the fasting period. But if you go to, you know, most of the Arab countries, the Muslim nations, they work after sunset. So during okay. the day, so they turn, they turn it upside the other way around. So during the day, you sleep, you rest. When you break your fast, you come to the office and come and work. Okay. That's how they do it, especially in Saudi Arabia. Now let's go to the mosque. Mm -hmm. There's this misconception, uh, you, well, you are going to tell us if it's a misconception or not, that uh, a lot of men find women in the mosque because they see the woman's figure and everything while praying in the mosque. How is the mosque really section like? How is it like? Do men mingle with women in there? In the mosque, the men are in front and the women are behind. So men don't see the women? Mm -mm. Even the entry places are different. But the women see the men? The women can see the men because okay. the men are in front of them. Some mosques have barriers mm. between, you know, the spaces of men and women. But then, originally, there was, so, there was not supposed to have a barrier. During the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his mosque, there was no barrier between male and females. But then, the males are in front and the females are behind. Doesn't that uh, put women behind in terms of status? No. You see, let's understand one thing that... It has not got nothing to do with status, okay? It's just an arrangement. When we segregate our washrooms and say this is for the males and this is for the female, does it mean that we've status? No, it's just the way the organization has been put. That's all, that men are in front and women are behind, and that's mm. it. And can non-Muslims visit the mosque? We are encouraging non-Muslims to come to the mosque. During the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is a city called Najran, and they were Christians. And they visited him for a debate, a dialogue, and they stayed in his mosque for three days. And they had the debates in the mosque with him for three days. So most Christians and non-Muslims are encouraged to visit the mosque. When you visit the mosque, same way when we visited, you know, go to the schools and then we saw the singing and then we saw the, the worship, we understood what Christianity is about. So you find that the average Muslim understand Christianity a lot. You can say I'm quoting Bible verses here. It's because we, we read the Bible, we know the Bible, we know it as 66 books, we know there's Old Testament, there's New Testament, the first five books were written by Moses. We know all those things because we, 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 get, we got closer to you to understand your religion. So same way we encourage non-Muslims to visit the mosque to ask questions. 
Yeah, in the masjid, there are no knives and guns and clubs whereby if you enter, boo, 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 boo. no, there's nothing like that. It's just mats. It's an open space. There are no chairs there. You take off your shoes or you put on your shoes. You enter the mosque and then you sit down and then you listen to whatever the imam is saying. You, you have that. When we do that, we get closer. This, all these myths, all these misconceptions, it wouldn't be an issue in, in the Ghanaian, you know, society or community. So no Muslim will not be sacked when at they all, enter the mosque? At all. Even the national mosque can at they, all. Yes, they can enter. the national mosque, enter the mosque. Mm. If the mosque of the prophets, Christians and non-Muslims are allowed to enter, is the national mosque more, you know, more spiritual uplifting or more, you know, or more, you know, position, better position than the mosque of the prophet? No, it's not. So non-Muslims entered the mosque. The mosque, they came, and then even when times of you know farming and disasters happened, the mosque was a f place of shelter. Well, there are some Muslims who do not shake hands with women. They don't hug women or people of the other uh, sex or gender. Is that also uh, one of the criteria for being a Muslim? In Islam, there are relationships. There are relationships between family members and their relationships between people who are not family members. If a woman is not a close family member of yours, she's not your mother, she's not your sister, she's not your wife, she's not your auntie, she's not your grandmother, you're not supposed to touch her. That's Islam. Yes, you're not supposed to touch her. Islam is very, very, very careful and mindful about sexual harassment. Some men, by virtue of trying to be friendly with women, hug them in a way that is not right. So Islam is saying, we don't even want you to go to that extent. You are only entitled to touch your mother because your mother, if you touch your mother and then you have any sexual intention, then you are a devil. If you touch your own sister and then you have any sexual intention, you are a devil. But other women, there is a tendency that you by default, harass her that way. And women will tell you that there is nothing more traumatic than being sexually abused, being used by a man, like just a tissue of a name thrown away. So Islam is saying, no handshaking between people of the opposite sex. No hugging. We can relate. We can work in the same office. I can sit with you in the same office and discuss ideas. That is why Islam instituted, you see, this dress code. That a Muslim woman must be covered. So that when I sit with a Muslim woman, I'm only having an intercourse with her brain, not her body. Because if I'm sitting with a woman and then she has a cleavage, and I'm a man, my reproductive system and my nervous system is working. And when I see those things, definitely I'll be confused. You can see... Two well-dressed gentlemen standing by the roadside discussing a serious business issue and a lady comes bus, pass, 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 passing by and then she shakes her body and then they forget what they are doing. That's how men we are, whether we like it or not. And so Islam, in protecting that, says that there must be segregation between the male and the female. No man should touch a woman who is not his family member. Don't touch her. Don't get closer to her. If you're getting closer to her, it must be for a reason. So that, and then her dress code should, that should be covered. Her clothes should not be tight-fitting. It shouldn't reveal 36, 28, 36. It shouldn't reveal anything. So that when you are interacting with her, you are interacting with her based on merit, not because of sexual advances. So I'm going to ask for the many Muslim men mm -hmm. who go around hugging and shaking women, are they the devils? Are they on the wrong side of God? No, we wouldn't say they are devils, no. Okay. We wouldn't say they are the wrong side of God. What we say is that they are doing something that Islamically they are not supposed to do. Yeah. Not supposed to do at all. It's not right. A Muslim man, or even a man in general, is not supposed to hug, hold a woman who doesn't be... It's not his. I mean, for example, if I see you holding my wife, I will not be happy. So why would I go and hold someone else's wife? Hold her waist and then play with her waist beads, you know, tickle her. It's not right. Islam says no way. Mm. Don't create that atmosphere whereby women will be sexually harassed. Islam says no way. It doesn't give even an inch of that. 
It says when you are dealing with women, deal with her because of her intellect. Deal with her because of her capacities and her capabilities. Don't deal with her because you want to have some sexual advances towards her. Now let's talk about the woman. Mm -hmm. Well, with dress code, you mentioned that there's a dress code. You need to cover up some parts of mm -hmm. the body. And there are so many other women who we know are Muslims, but they don't dress like the Muslims we see mm -hmm. with the long veils mm -hmm. and covering up totally. Is, is, is it against, or is it a sin, if I may use that word, to not look like what is prescribed by the religion? It is a sin. It's a sin because it's very, very categorical in the Quran that the Almighty Allah says, women should cover up. Men should also cover up. Sometimes we don't, we don't, we don't equalize it. Men should cover up. Sometimes you see someone enters the masjid and then when he prostrates, excuse me, you can see he's behind. It is wrong. It's a sin in Islam. In Islam, men do not wear tight-fitting clothes that you come to the office and then his abs and then his biceps and then his thighs are showing and then he's confusing the women in the office. Islam also says no to that. So the dress code is not only for women, it's for men. And then the reason being that Islam wants to protect the society from illicit sexual activities. Because if you observe now, the cheapest thing now is sex, with all due respect. And excuse my language. If you want to be famous now in this country, strip naked on TikTok and that's it. You become a celebrity in our country. That's what we do now. Islam says no way. We don't give fools the chance to control the narrative in our community. We need to have right-thinking people, people who are modest, people who are courteous, people who are chaste. They are not supposed to be our role models. Look at the role models now that the youth are following. With all due respect, I'm not going to mention any names. But then, what impact do they have in our communities that is morally, morally upright? We don't have. Islam says, no way. So, Protect human that. rights activists say, uh, it's suppression of women because normally nobody talks about the men it's always about the women but women women i'm here speaking about the men too mm. the problem is this we've commodified the body of the woman we are advertising for a car and then a woman is in bikini standing next to the car what does it mean boxing even boxing round one a woman in bikini round two what's the relationship between the boxing and then the woman in bikini what's the relationship We've commercialized the woman's body. That is, that is progression. That is civilization. That is advancement. No. We are saying our women are, are, are sacred. Our women should be protected from prying eyes. Not just any Tom, Dick, and Harry can look at my sister. No way. Islam says no way. If you want to have that exclusive access to that woman, let her be your wife that you have that exclusive access to her. But then a young lady dresses anyhow on the streets, she bends down and then you see everything. And then we have everything free now. That is why people are not getting married because everything is free. If I want to have any sexual satisfaction, I just come and sit by the roadside and then cross my leg and then the women are passing and then mm, and I'm fine, I go back. <laughs> That's what happens. Mm. Sometimes you sit with women one-on-one, -on -one, you can't face them because of what they are wearing. They must do this, do this, cross their legs, they can't sit upright because of what they are wearing. Islam says the woman's body is not for commercial purposes. And that's what is going on now in the world. The woman's body has been commercialized. So those of us who are saying, no way, uh, the body of our women should not be commercialized, they see us as people who are suppressing the women. They see us as people who are terrorists. They see us as people who are not advanced. We are living in the stone age. My final word. Before your final word, <laughs> my producer has a question, okay. which I think is very important to her. Mm -hmm. I don't know her intentions, mm -hmm. but she's asking. She's non-Muslim, mm -hmm. and she wants to marry, or the man after her is mm -hmm. a Muslim. Now. Do Muslims accept or agree to men, Muslim men, marrying non-Muslim women? In Islam, Muslim men can marry Jewish and Christian women. Mm. But then, Jewish or Christian men cannot marry Muslim women. Okay. Let, let me take it again. Yeah. Muslim men, mm -hmm. I, for example, I can marry a Christian woman. Okay. I can marry a Jewish woman. It's allowed in Islam. But then the Christian man or the Jewish man, when he comes to me to give me his sister or my, to give him my sister or my daughter, Ooh, I won't give it to him. Okay. The reason being, Islam says that the woman has rights under Islam. And the Muslim man is bound by religion by the religion, to give that woman her rights. 
But then the Christian man or the Jewish man is not bound by Muslim you know, law for him to give that Muslim woman her rights. So in safeguarding her from that and also not accusing him falsely for not giving her her rights, we say we are not giving her to you at all. I hope you understand. So my producer who is uh, looking for her to get him married to a to Muslim man, man, it means she can still be a Christian. She can, be, she can still be a Christian. Mm. Nobody is supposed, no Christian woman marrying a Muslim man is supposed to convert. No. She goes to her church, she goes to her synagogue, and then he goes to his mosque, and then they are, they are a happy couple. It is stated in the Quran, Quran chapter 5, verse 3. Yes. But here you are talking about uh, Jewish and... Christian, Christian woman, it's it means specific. Any other religion outside of Jewish and Christian, a Muslim man cannot marry that woman. Yes, there's a difference of opinion between you know Muslim Jewish on that. Mm. But then the predominant view is that Christian and Jewish women are allowed because Islam, Judaism, and Christianity have some similarities. You see, and they are also, I believe, they are the only monotheistic religions in the world. Yeah. All the other religions have this pagan stuff, stuff, stuff in there. But then Christianity and Judaism have, you know, believe in one God and stuff like that. So Muslims, Muslim men are allowed. And we have a lot of similarities between, you know, the three religions. That is why it is allowed. And now your final words. My final words. You, you, you almost let me forget. <laughs> with, the, with the morality and then the dress code. I say, if stripping naked is civilization then animals are more civilized than humans. Hmm. Those are quite strong words, and we want to thank you. Sheikh Kishk Bashir Yandu, he's the founder of Al Isla Center. Thank you very much for coming. This is the lowdown on Ghana Web TV. We are going to air, or we air every Monday on Ghana Web TV and on all of our digital channels. My name is Ismail Akwe. Watch us every Monday. Be safe.